morning, Sable Christian Fellowship. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for being here. Um, we want to make a couple things really off the top, uh, make you aware of them right off the top. The first thing is, is usually we have prayer cards and connection cards in the seats, but clearly that you're not here. And so uh, we have digital ways of connecting with us, and they will be in the chat. Uh, I think it's over going to be on that side of the screen. The other thing is, is that chat, we would love to communicate with you. We would love to uh, just conversate. This is the only time that you can talk in church. And so, um, not the only time, but uh, we're encouraging you to talk during church right now. And so, please take advantage of the chat bar, the chat, se chat section over there. We have a couple of hosts that have joined us, and they're going to help welcome you in and, and ask some questions and provide links for you and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, if, if you're watching on a smart TV and you don't see a chat, feel free to open up a second device and join in the chat, which is, again, I think going to be on that side. And if it's not, then it's on that side. Either way, it's on one of the sides of the video. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens after that. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. If you joined us last week, thank you for joining us l last week as well. Um, we, had a, we had a great time. It's new, it's different, but we had a great time just engaging in conversation, and we were blown away with the response and the attendance and, and all that kind of stuff. So thank you so much for joining us last week, and thank you again for coming back. And if this is your first time, thank you for popping in and, and uh, checking us out. We really, really appreciate it, especially in this time. Uh, we hope that you uh, feel somewhat at home. I mean, you're hopefully you're at home right now, but hopefully you feel somewhat at home uh, as joining our congregation online here. Uh, let's just admit right off the top that this is still all new and different and difficult. Um, and we've heard at some point over the last little while that despite the fact that we're not meeting here together, but we're scattered across the region and even in our case, the continent, um, no matter how far scattered we are, we are together. Uh, we're together online, but we're together. And you're not alone. I even if you're sitting in a room all by yourself, you, uh, please know that you're not alone. You are with us. If you're watching this, you are with us right now. Different, new, weird maybe, but I hope you find some encouragement that you are not alone. I also, we also need to point out this, that uh, I don't, we want to help you. And so uh, please take advantage of the email help at solvablechurch.ca. If you want to help somebody, reach out through that email and let us know. If you need help, do not be ashamed. Do not be prideful. Just simply send an email. It's confidential. No one else will know. Uh, send an email to help at solvablechurch.ca, and we will do the very best we can to make sure that you either get groceries or deliveries or whatever you need where you are right now. If we don't do that as a church, we're not doing our job. So please take advantage of that email. I almost want to say, please call the number below. Please email the email below uh, so we can help you out. Okay, enough silliness. I, I need to move on. Uh, probably not going to edit this out. Okay. There has been some adjustment to the situation that we're in. I've had to adjust, but I've been reminded over and over and over again that we are not, uh, we are not alone, and it's not permanent, and it's not impossible. Last week, if you watched us, I'll give you a quick reminder. Last week, uh, we left the book of Deuteronomy, and Dave Hamill shared his insights and thoughts on Psalm 91. Thank you so much for that, Dave, as well. Uh, a very timely passage in the days that we're living in. This week, we're looking at the book of Joshua, and like any book uh, in the Bible, there is a ton to pick out. There is so much information, and I can't handle everything. Uh, but I do want to land on one specific thing, which we're going to get to in, in a brief moment or two. Or two. If you have your Bible, please open it up to the book of Joshua. It's the sixth book in the Bible, so it's right near the front. Uh, it's also page 178 in my Bible, so it's probably somewhere around there for you if you're using a hard Bible. If you're looking for a digital Bible, there'll be a link in the, in the chat room over there. Uh, you can just click on the link that will be provided, and it'll open up to an online Bible so you can read along and even make notes and, and highlight things and, and whatever else is helpful for you. When we, when we read of Joshua, we read of a very similar situation as, as we're in right now. We're in a situation of hopelessness and despair and discouragement and anxiety and fears. We read of a nation who lost a leader in Moses, but Joshua comes in and he's appointed by God. And we learn a little bit about who Joshua is back in Numbers chapter 13. Joshua was one of the 12 spies who went ahead and scoped out the land and, and, and kind of checked things out. And he, he and Caleb came back with glowing reports. It's the land of milk and honey and it's fruitful and it's wonderful and we can... It's ours, and we can take it. Twelve spies went out there. Two came back saying, let's go. The other ten were full of discouragement and despair, and they were scared, and they were fearful. 
In Numbers 10, we begin to see the, of how Joshua lived. He was a man of faith. He, he said, God will give us the land. The land is ours, so let's take it. God has called us to something. If God calls it, it's ours. Let's just go. There's no questioning. There's no doubt. There's no fear. That's just how Joshua lived. And I think there's a lesson there for us. There's a sermon there for sure. It's not today's sermon, but there's a sermon there for sure. As we read through the book of Joshua, we read of a faith-filled general who leads his nation into the land that God promised them. We read of a nation who conquers the land and takes it back from the Canaanites. We read of victories that, that were because of obedience, and we read of defeat that was because of sin. We read of miracles where the sun stood still. We read of God's promise being fulfilled and the land being divided among all 12 tribes. It was a dream come true for the nation of Israel. But all of that could not have happened until they crossed the Jordan River. Ahead of them was a land of giants and impossibilities and unknowns and fears and anxieties. Does this sound a little familiar right now? But God promised them a new land. And just as God promised them a new land full of rest and peace and hope, Jesus in in John 10.10 gave us a promise of a hope and a future. In 1 Peter 5, we read uh, that we are to cast our worries and he will give us rest, another promise given to us. I'm going to be honest for a little bit here, so bear with me. This verse has been really hard for me to live by the last week. I haven't been sleeping. Uh, 3 o'clock in the morning is usually bedtime for me, which isn't healthy or good. Even as I wrote this and as I prep it and even as I'm speaking it, I'm thinking, man, I really need to practice what I preach. I need to practice the, the message and the sermon and the teaching that God has promised us peace and rest and hope. There's no worry, there's no anxiety, there's no fear that can take that away, or there shouldn't be, because what God has promised, he will deliver. Not in our timing, but in his. So the question is, will you be like Joshua? Will you see past the giants? Will you see past the, the walled cities? Will you see past... Uh, the, the, the frustration and the anxiety and the worry will you see past what you think you have to accomplish and just rest in God's promise. And so we find Joshua and the nation are at the banks of the Jordan River. We read in Joshua 3 that the river is overflowing. And so not only do the nation has, not only do they have to take the land ahead of them and conquer everything, but they also now have to cross over an impossible uh, thing. They, there's no way that they can cross it. And yet, there's a miracle that happens, and and many of us have read this already, but we're not there yet. Because Joshua says a very important important thing in Joshua 3, verse 5. Before they cross the river, they have to consecrate themselves. He could have said, you need to prepare for battle. He could have said, sharpen your swords and gather up your shields and eat a good pasta meal, a good carb meal, and do some push-ups and and, do some stretches and get ready to do battle, because that's what we're going to do. But Joshua knew what lay ahead of them. Joshua knew that what what was required was them to be ready spiritually. So what does it mean to consecrate? Side note, I'm probably going to mess that word up a couple times. So because this is actually like take 550. So I'm going to mess up that word. Just laugh along with me as I do. What does it mean to consecrate? I think it's an important word to understand because it's not a word that we use on a regular basis. We don't, in our English language in 2020, we don't say, I'm going to go consecrate the laundry. It's a holy word. That's why we don't use it every day or at all. It's a a very specific holy word. It means to be set apart. It means to be sanctified. It means, in this text, in the Hebrew word is kadash, and I'm probably saying that wrong, so I apologize, but it comes from the word kadosh. Again, probably saying that wrong. But this is the same word. Here's the key point. This is the same word that the angels use uh, when they're ministering to God around the throne. The same angels that sing out, holy, 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 that, this is that word. They are singing out, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. We read in Leviticus chapter 11 that God tells his people to be holy for I am holy. This is that same word. It's reinforced again in 1 Peter chapter 1 where uh, it's, it, it's written again and again. And we read it both in the Old Testament and the New Testament because it's important for all generations to understand and to live by that. It's important for the generations who lived under the law to strive to be holy because God is holy. It's important for those that live under grace 
to be holy because he is holy. We are to be holy. We are to be set apart. We are to be consecrated. We are to be more like God. Sadly, we live in a world where sometimes the representation of God is skewed. We live in a world where the representation of God is messed up, where people do things or behave in a way that they say is God, but it really isn't. And maybe because of those experiences, maybe we get confused or we get angry and we get hurt because people of God treated us a certain way. Can I stop right there for a second and say this? We as a church are on this journey to know who God is, to become like Jesus, and to change our world. These are just not buzzwords. This is a, a, a mindset. These are mile markers in our faith. We, and yet, while we strive for those things, we are human and we mess up. We screw up. For me personally, for the last two years, this terminology of know God, become like Jesus, change our world, uh, these spiritual disciplines have been implanted in me and they have, I hope, started to help me. Because I'm starting to ask a question such as this. How am I helping someone know God? How am I helping my son know who God is? Are my actions and behaviors and thoughts and habits, are they causing him to want to know who God is? Is the example I'm setting one of God? And not just my son, but the, youth, the students in the youth ministry and my neighbors and my family and the stranger at the grocery store. Am I allowing my own perceptions and beliefs and opinions get in the way of what I read in the Bible? Now, we are in this time that our world is going through, and in this time, this is a time more than, I mean, every time is the time, but really, this is the time to shine your light. This is the time to, to be bright in a dark place. The darkness of fear and worry and anxiety are reaching across our globe, and this is the time to reach out and offer love and care and support, or just simply human conversation. Pick up a phone and dial it, or text, or email, or FaceTime, or just give somebody, reach, look over your fence, and as long as you're six feet away from somebody, look over your fence and say hi. Engage. I, I've never seen so many people going for bike rides and going for walks and everything else. Take those opportunities to be that weird person and say, hey, how you doing? Who knows what kind of conversation will happen out of that? I digress. I apologize. The Israelites knew what it meant to consecrate themselves. When they heard the word, there was no seminar, there was no teaching series, there was no questions, there was no form to fill out. They just knew exactly how serious that command was. To consecrate meant to clean themselves from any contamination that they came in contact with. Maybe that point is a little bit too close to home, but bear with me. Here's the reality. God told them uh, to not do a whole bunch of things. He gave them Ten Commandments and all these laws. Uh, and, and how many of us have obeyed our parents to perfection? My parents are watching, so I probably shouldn't raise my hand that high. We, we don't, because we're human and we sin, we mess up. So here was a chance to make themselves pure once again. Here was a chance to make themselves blameless and sanctified. Here was a, 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 t a chance for them to uh, make things right. Anything that they may have come in contact with that caused them to be full of sin, here was a chance to discard that and move on. So what does this mean for us? It means this. It's been said that we are on the brink of something, that we are on the edge, that there's a, something about to happen. And we don't know what or when, but something is there. We, are in, we have this feeling, we have this, 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 we're waiting for, we're anticipating God to move in a very big way. What that looks like and how or where or when, we don't know, but there's this feeling. So maybe, maybe, what is needing to happen is that we consecrate ourselves. If we want to consecrate ourselves, if we want to prepare ourselves, and if we want to prepare for God to move in a really crazy, big, weird way, we need to make sure we're obeying him in every part of our life. We need to make sure that there's nothing contaminating our relationship with God. We need to make sure that uh, we need to fix any area of our life that is making us unholy before God. So what does that mean in detail? I, I'm not going to go too much into detail. 
I think most of you can understand what I'm trying to say. But I will say this. We need to repent of false beliefs. We need to repent of allowing our own opinions to become those beliefs. We need to stop fighting with each other. <laughs> we need to stop being selfish and stop trying to push our own agenda. It means we need to clean ourselves from everything that distracts us from God. For me and for maybe some of you growing up, whenever I heard that phrase, it, it always the, the pastor or the preacher always said, we need to turn away from lust and drinking and smoking and bad movies. Like those were the, the big things that we need to turn away from. And, and they are. I'm not downplaying them. But I also don't want to put sins on a pedestal and put one higher over the other. Sin is sin. If it's distracting you from God and distracting you from your relationship with God, it's sin. So, is your sin, is, is fill in the blank. I only do blank a couple times a week or a couple times a month or whatever. Is that causing you to be separated from God? Is it distancing, uh, is it distancing you from God? Are you sacrificing your relationship or are you sacrificing you even getting to know who God is because of fill in the blank? The key word here in Joshua 3.5 is not just the word consecrate, but it's also to consecrate yourselves. This isn't a, oh, my pastor or small group leader will help me do this. I'll just need to listen to them and I'll be fine. This isn't a, my pastor or small group leader is going to pray for me and then I'm okay. This is a, you need to do it. No one's going to change your habits. People have been trying to change my habit of nail biting for the last 38 years, 39 years. Oh, I'm 39. 39 years. No one's going to change that but me. No one else is going to change your thoughts or your beliefs. No one else is going to change your bad attitude. No one else is going to change your, your faithless thoughts. No one else is going to forgive that person that wronged you, or no one else is going to ask for forgiveness for you. No one else is going to make you have a strong commitment to your faith community. No one else is going to make you do anything to strengthen your relationship with God. This is a choice, and this is a choice that only you can make. Kids, students, this is also a choice that you can make. Don't ride on your parents' coattails. That's a probably illustration that's lost on some of you. But don't wait for your parents to tell you what to do. If you're listening to this as a student from grade 6 to 12 or even younger, if you can understand, if you can comprehend what I'm saying, then you can make a choice. You can either choose to begin to know who God is or continue to know who God is, or the choice the opposite way is, is not. Wow, this is really heavy, Andy. This is really hard. It is, and as I shared with some of you earlier on this week, what I like to think is that this is like a, a, kind of a hammer coming down, but it's like a kid's squeaky toy hammer. So it's the visual is a hammer, but it, you know it's kind of okay. It's there's there's love behind it, and there's compassion, and there's there's conviction even in myself. So please don't feel like I'm I'm trying to. Rrr. Consecration is a hard idea. It's a hard message, but it's necessary. Let's continue looking at consecrate yourselves. I think we get the point of how we need to focus on ourselves, but allow me to point out one more, one more thing. It doesn't say consecrate others. It doesn't say to point out the faults in other church membership uh, members or, or other leadership. It doesn't say to point out the faults uh, in your neighbor or your spouse or other groups in the church. We are to consecrate and make ourselves right before God. This is simply Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus uses the example of the plank in, in your, own, your own eye or the plank in someone else's eye versus the log in your, your eye. This, isn't, this is simply looking at your own log and taking it out before you point out sin in everybody, anybody else. Consecrate yourself. Here's something that stuck out to me, and here's something that I even asked myself while I was reading this and studying and learning question is this, if they didn't follow through and consecrate themselves, would God still do what he did? I don't know. What I do know is this, is that it matters what we do. The point of this is that obedience 
matters. They were told to do something and they did it. It matters if we follow through with the commands of God. It matters if we have faith in God and in what he says and in his promises. We're not quite there yet in the Bible and I don't want to spill the beans, but bear with me for a second. In 2 Kings 13, Elisha the prophet tells the king of Israel to strike the ground with arrows and he struck he strikes the ground uh, three times and Elijah the prophet gets angry and tells him he should have done it more because now he's only, only, only uh, excuse me he's only going to defeat the enemy three times. Can you imagine if he struck the, the, the ground with the arrow 20 times or 100 times? The point is this, it mattered what the king did and it matters what we do. It matters what the Israelites did. In Joshua chapter 7, Joshua and the army lost a battle and God tells Joshua it's because there's sin in the camp. We later find out what the sin was. We find out who was responsible. But I think there's a very powerful picture of how one person's sin can cause the entire nation to suffer. This isn't a guilt trip. Trust me, I grew up hearing this message over and over and over again about how one person's sin can ruin it for everybody else. I'm not at all trying to guilt trip anybody. I'm just letting you know what the Bible says is that if God's going to move for a community, we all need to focus on ourselves and make sure that we're all good. We can't point sin out at other people. We, need, we can't consecrate other, people's, other people and, and their, their behavior. We need to consecrate ourselves. We're not he- here to go hunting for sin. We're not here to go through everybody's life and figure out what's, what's wrong or what's right or anything. I'm here to look and say we all need to be responsible for ourselves. We're here, we need to do an honest, hard look. And we need to see where we need to consecrate ourselves and what area of our life do we need to give back to God. Here's the bottom line. If you take the time and steps necessary to consecrate yourself, if you take the time necessary to make yourself right with God, and through that you become the light of God in your community or in your neighborhood, even in this time of social distancing, if your actions and your words and your behavior, if your habits start to cause people to turn to Jesus, if those things start to cause people to ask questions about God, if that's all because of you cleaning up your heart and your mind and your soul, think of the change that could happen. In Deuteronomy, we read this back in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we were reminded again in Matthew chapter 22 that we are commanded to love God and love others. We're told to love God with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength and to do that with our neighbors as well. Are those parts of you clean? Are they consecrated? Are they set apart? Is your heart and mind and soul and strength are all of that helping you to love your neighbor as yourself? Is every part of your life clean and focused on God? Is there anything distracting you from getting to know God more? If you take the time and steps necessary, you could be the result of change in others. Or you could be the result of others suffering because of your choices just like the sin of Achan in Joshua chapter 7. Here's the point. The result of Joshua's command was that they did consecrate themselves and God did do wonders. As they approached the river, it parted just like in the Red Sea and they walked on dry ground and this was only the beginning of miracles that they saw. When they stopped and consecrated themselves, God did wonders for them and through them. We read about how in Joshua, they were the example to the nations around them about who God is. And so God did wonders for them and through them. What is it that God wants to do with you? What is it that he wants to do with this church, through this church, in this community, in your community, for our community? God has an amazing plan. He has a purpose for each of us each of us individually and corporately. But he's just not going to hand it to us. We have to prepare ourselves. We have to prepare ourselves physically and mentally and emotionally and even spiritually. Actually, first spiritually and then the other ones. So as we find ourselves with maybe some extra time on our hands for the next little while, maybe maybe in that extra time we have some honest heart-to-heart moment conversations with God. Maybe we do what we can to put things right. Maybe in this next little while, we prepare ourselves for what God has for all of us next. 
maybe we continue to reach out and have conversations with our neighbors and friends and family and include them in this process of making things right and consecrating ourselves. Is there someone you need to ask forgiveness from? Then do it. Humble yourself and ask for forgiveness. Is there someone that you need to forgive? Pick up a phone. Let them know. Is there something in your life that you need accountability in? Is there a habit or a mindset or this belief that you have that you know you're struggling with and you just you need help and you need accountability? Reach out. Ask someone. Is there a habit or behavior or an opinion that you've been holding on to that you know you have to let go of? Do it. It's not going to be easy, but it's needed and necessary. Let us all as Sobel Christian Fellowship, as Christians, whether you call Sobel Christian Fellowship your home church or not, if you're watching this, let me ask you to consider, do what we need to do so that when God calls us to go, when he says, go across the Jordan River because the land I have for you is there. But before you do that, you need to consecrate. When God says to do that, let us do that. Maybe that is today. Because who knows, maybe tomorrow or next week, the river will be stopped, the dry ground will be open, and we'll be able to go into the land that God has for us. Let's pray. Father God, this morning as people are listening and watching, and even as they watch it later on in, in the week or whenever they do, my hope and prayer is that we will take time to do what is necessary to make ourselves right with God. God, my prayer is that even right now, may we not have people come into our minds that we think that they need to get things right. God, may we focus on ourselves. May we be a little bit selfish in this time and just simply focus on our relationship with you. God, right now, if there's something that is hindering us from getting to know you more, if there's pride, if there's unbelief, if there's uh, bad habits, whatever there is, God, may we, even right now, submit that to you and give that to you. God, may we uh, daily, in, even in this time with maybe more time on our hands, may we purposely find time to, to have conversations with you. God, if we're feeling alone, may we reach out and ask for help. God, if, if we have uh, time to give, may we reach out to others as we feel led by you. God, as we wrap up today, thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to spend time together, even in a, in a digital way. But may we also focus on spending time with you in a very real relational way. Praise all in Jesus' name. Amen.